Hi, I'm Jay Tickin. I'm a whole school lead practitioner in teaching and learning, and I'm a trust wide lead practitioner in English. And I'm going to talk to you today about instructional coaching, guiding improvement one step at a time. I have now sat down to many performance management meetings or appraisals or reviews. In fact, what you are looking at now is the first page of my performance management document from September 2014. Whatever these might have been called, the actual process has been very similar. I'm sure that it will sound very familiar to some of you. You would conjure up three targets that you were going to achieve in that year to prove your worth and existence. One would probably be linked to results, even though the union said we weren't supposed to do that. One would be linked to wider school or pastoral issue or project. And one might involve you doing some planning or training for your department. Great. What a well-rounded professional that you were proving yourself to be. And this was the next step. Proof. Evidence was needed, meaning that one of these targets needed to be linked to a lesson observation. If you were really organised, you would get your timetables out there and then, find the suitable lesson, write this into your planner and highlight it. Even the most disorganised of teachers would ensure that they had at least chosen the right class. And this meant the best class. Compliant, eager to please, just knowledgeable enough to make you look good, but so that you could show that all important progress and when that lesson observation came around, come hell or high water, regardless of what you were actually really teaching, you could pull out your fail safe, good with outstanding features showpiece, and it would run like clockwork as it always did, and would get you what you needed. Proof that you were not a bad teacher. That was your job ticked off for another year. Phew. Now, perhaps some of you are lucky enough to not have experienced this kind of rigmarole, but I participated in this merry dance for many years. As you can see here, I chose my class and my lesson focus and it top set, obviously, period one, on the thing that I was most confident in as a senior examiner, I chose it in September before I even knew my class. Was this really the best thing for my development as a teacher? No, <laughs> it's not designed to be. What it is, is judgment dressed up as development. And this does not improve teaching and learning. With this possibly being your one observation in a whole term or even in a whole year, one would imagine that the feedback would be something of great value and carefully honed to help you to make progress. Unfortunately, this has regularly not been the case. When I asked on Twitter, I received myriad stories of terrible feedback that were either completely unactionable, such as this first one from an English specialist. My line manager, the deputy head, observed me with year 11. They were writing about Romeo and Juliet in some exam prep style. Feedback was, this would have been outstanding, but one of the students said they were tired of always analysing literature. And secondly, 
I was once told my lesson wasn't outstanding, but was good because it lacked that thing. When I asked what it was, there was no answer. It's pretty hard to action something when you don't know what the thing is. Other feedback uh, I thought was just completely arbitrary. And I've got some examples of that to show you. Head of department brought me a cup of tea as we'd had a fire alarm over break. My only feedback was, I have a real issue with you having a hot drink on your desk. Another one, I once received feedback saying I couldn't have outstanding because the room was too cold. It was snowing outside. And finally, I got feedback once whilst training saying that my lever arch folder was too bright. It was pink and therefore distracting to the children. I asked where she'd seen it in the lesson and she hadn't. It was only when I brought it to the staff room to go over stuff. Is it any wonder that uh, I and many others became so disillusioned with the performance development and observation process? And this is the problem with a model that is trying to be both summative and formative. So just like a child doing a mock exam, the focus is always on the grade, not on the feedback. The feedback, which should be paramount, becomes an afterthought. It's just another box to tick rather than a systematic action, which when focused on, will move you towards a being a better practitioner. I'm going to talk to you about a better way, instructional coaching. We're going to look at what it is, why we do it, and most importantly, how to do it. When I was asked to be a coach, like many others, I think, my view of coaching was more aligned with what we would probably term growth coaching or basic coaching. And this would be where a coach works very collaboratively in a guidance role through asking questions to enable the person being coached to self-direct their own development, coming up with their own answers. I know that that works really well for a lot of people and a lot of people view that really positively. But also for many people, it can be quite frustrating. I think that that is especially true of our early career teachers. Or indeed, for our more experienced teachers with whom we are trying to develop very new strategies or ways of working which might feel very alien and uncertain. Instructional coaching is different to this and that's because it is expert led and it is more directive. Instructional coaches need to be chosen very carefully as as well as having that relationship, which is still very important. They also need to be able to embody the pedagogy which they are developing in the teachers that they are coaching so that they can help them to develop in that. As this reference from um, a research paper from Dr. Lorraine Hammond summarises, you will see how important that coach's knowledge is as the expert. And I really recommend reading this research paper. And there's also a podcast where she talks about it if you want to find out more. I'll just give you a moment to read that.
So now that we know what it is, let's think about why we need to do instructional coaching. Well, firstly, because this model, looking back at this performance development model that we looked at, it doesn't help to develop teachers and nor does this. This style of feedback is sporadic and often arbitrary and unactionable. So with instructional coaching, I would say that the focus is perhaps less personal and more focused on improving the outcomes for our learners. Improving teacher instruction is really vital for this. Studies have shown that vast differences are made by the quality of teacher instruction on learning, such as um, a study which shows that in a group of 50 teachers, the most effective could teach the same learning in just six months compared to the average teachers whilst the least effective teacher took two years compared to the average teachers. And there have been several studies that have shown that it is for those learners who come from disadvantaged backgrounds, that there are the greatest benefits from improved teacher instruction and real quality teacher instruction. So through us improving teacher instruction, we are literally changing and bettering lives. And that's what we're here to do. So now we come to the how. Would you sit the children you teach down to complete a GCSE exam or the SATs or their phonics check? before completing any lessons in that. How would you expect them to get on with that task? The same applies for developing teachers. Firstly, you need to know what you are learning. Instructional coaching will require that you select a clear model so that there is clarity over what it is that you are trying to achieve. For example, the school that I am based in as a coach, and in fact, all of the schools that I work with across the trust um, that I work across, make this very easy because we have a very clear focus on explicit instruction, knowledge rich curricula and warm strict behavior. And having that clarity means that I know the goal. I know what we are looking for. Your school might have very different approaches and that is totally fine, but it's the clarity over what those approaches are that is really important. So that the teachers know the goal, the school knows the goal, you know the goal. That goal is shared for everyone. So that the teachers really understand that goal, they need to therefore engage in some professional learning about that style of teaching. And this means that they know the outcomes that they're going to be working towards and that you'll be able to have a shared language that will make your feedback conversations clearer and more efficient as well. Putting instructional coaching into action requires setting up coaching relationships. What's really important here is that there is a strong level of trust between you. And this works on different levels. Firstly, what's imperative is that there is a common understanding that this is about development and not judgment. And for that reason, a line manager may not be the best person to be a teacher's coach. And I would say particularly if they're a more experienced teacher who 
is more likely to be wary about this coaching being something that is there to catch them out um, and be used as a, a judgment thing. There also needs to be some clarity set out around communication from the start. Is the coach going to share any of this feedback with anybody else? That needs to be made clear because otherwise developmental feedback could be wrongly used to make judgments. And remember that this is formative and not summative. There also needs to be trust in the coach as the expert and that they know what they are doing. I know that if I were training for a marathon, I would want someone like Paula Radcliffe to be coaching me to get there. And I would trust in her to know what she was doing because that's her area of expertise. I certainly wouldn't want me training somebody to, to run a marathon. However, if I wanted training in instruction, uh, sorry, in explicit instruction, I'd probably want me rather than Paula Radcliffe because I'm more of an expert in that area than she is. To do with trust though, a lot of this will come from a whole school culture and that will take some time to develop. So in order to help develop that, it's really important that the coaching is not viewed as something that is just for and it, you're struggling teachers. So what you might want to think about if you are setting up your first cycles of coaching is selecting some enthusiastic and vocal teachers who are going to be proliferating about their amazing coaching journey, including perhaps some of who are in leadership positions. That can help build this culture that shows we're all in this together, everyone needs to get better, it's for the sake of the children and not for ourselves. What we need to do is really build that confidence and trust that will mean that we welcome and invite our coach to come in and see that dark and sticky and irksome lesson that we're really struggling with and really plays on our mind so that they can help us to get better at it because that's where we need the help not showing off our obedient and clever clogs class because that isn't where we need as much help. And that brings me on to the observations. Once this coaching partnership is established, these observations can begin. But these are not like the observations of my old performance management experiences. Firstly, they are very regular, which means you can achieve visible incremental improvement. It also means that the observations become less of an event. Um, as I said, it's not about putting on a show. It's seeing what your normal everyday teaching looks like. What's the point of being an outstanding teacher two or three times a year? What we want is consistently strong teachers. That is what is going to make a difference to the learning in our schools. Secondly, observations can be short. So 15 to 20 minutes is enough time to see what needs to be improved in a teacher's uh, practice. And that also means that you can coach more than one teacher more easily. So you can be fitting in two or three observations in a lesson. So that means that you can have more and faster improvement in your school as a whole. And that is because the observations are focused. If you are using 
Paul Bambrick Santoyo's model from Get Better Faster or Leverage Leadership, both of which I very much recommend and were recommended to me when I started uh, learning about coaching. You may follow what is called a waterfall approach. This means you start from the top of a list of criteria, such as this list shown here. This is just the very, very start of one of the strands that they have. This one is all about routines um, behaviour. I'll just give you a moment to have a look at those. So you start at the top of this list and work down it. And as soon as you identify one that isn't being met, you can leave that lesson because you've got that one thing that you're going to work on that week. If you stay longer, you're going to find more things, but you, you don't need them. You're only working on one thing. That's your focus. Alternatively, you might want to stay for the whole 15, 20 minutes, but you want to identify the highest leverage point in that lesson. You are just looking for that one thing that you saw that will make the most difference to that teacher and their learners. And that will be the one thing that you focus on that week. If you are already moving along your coaching journey, you will already have a focus identified from the previous week. You'll be looking out for that to see if they've embedded it into their practice already. So this brings me on to the action steps and action steps and selecting those is critical. Action steps will need to be purposeful, very specific, and they need to be achievable within a week. The purpose will come from your shared goal and your shared understanding of what good teaching looks like. And that shared language that comes with this that you established in the rules and the first learning that you had at the start. It needs to be something that is going to make that teaching better. And although it's something that you will have observed in a very short amount of time in just one lesson, it needs to be something that can be genericized to apply to the majority of their lessons. Because you want to have the highest impact that you can across all of their teaching and all of the students that they teach. Precision is also extremely important. A word that's used in Get Better Faster and in Leverage Leadership is granular. So when we're thinking about granular, we're thinking about these tiny little grains of sand. So picking out that fine detail and refining it and making it perfect. And you're able to do that because it's so small, you can focus on it. And finally, actionable. So it's bite-sized and it's something that can be achieved within that coming week. Because we're looking at swift but sustained improvements, building up brilliant practice step by step as each of these action steps are mastered. This that you can see here is an example from the Ambition Institute's Step Lab, which is an amazing um, program on the computer that you use with the teacher you're coaching to do the coaching process, give them the steps, and you can see them visibly building up just like this. And I like this as well here because you can see how step two was repeated three times. And that's not a problem. You shouldn't be moving on until they have mastered that step. 
it's okay not to finish it in that week you shouldn't feel you have to move on it's more important to get it right so don't worry about having to repeat it it's okay to do that at last we get to the most important part of the process the coaching session itself it will be imperative to have some protected time for this. It needs to be somewhere that you won't be disturbed and the time needs to be enough that you have time to act on the feedback. 20 minutes is the minimum amount of time that you would need. And also you cannot just waltz in to these sessions without some prior thought. It needs preparation and it needs scripting. In fact, as time is so precious, what you might want to do is to assign clear timings to each section of the coaching session. This is something that um, Dixon's Academy do. And I would recommend watching Dixon's open source for their model of this if you desire that level of clarity and control, which ensures efficiency and effectiveness, because they do that really, really well. I use the like, notice, wonder framework when giving feedback. So you are starting with the positives, what you liked, but you're not giving empty platitudes here because this kind of praise is not effective and can actually be detrimental to motivation. Rather, the positive feedback needs to give a clear example of um, what was good, what you liked, and also why it was good. So, for example, rather than, oh, I loved the start of your lesson, which is very vague, it would be better to say, I liked how your use of clear instructions for the do now activity meant you had a calm and focused start to the lesson and meant everybody engaged with the retrieval activity. After your like, you need to be getting onto your action point. This is where you say what you noticed, which is the problem and then what you wonder, which is the solution. A good idea also is to front load this with why, the purpose. So you're putting the, the purpose of the action step before it. So rather than just stating the action step, for example, use clear visual cues at the end of the activity. Instead, you could say, I noticed that not all of the class were listening to the feedback on the retrieval exercise. So that you are sure that everyone is focused on you, I wonder if a clear visual cue would help. The next steps are, I think, vital. Modeling and deliberate practice. How can we do something if we aren't sure what it's supposed to look like. So just like as a teacher, I would model writing an amazing paragraph underneath the visualizer for my English scholars. I now as a coach need to model an amazing example of this action step for the teacher being coached. So, I honestly thought when I did my instructional coaching training and was told that this was part of the deal, that I would absolutely hate it. I thought it would be completely cringeworthy and um, a complete nightmare. But actually, it's quite fun. It needs to be scripted and it needs to be performed as if you are in front of the class. And, you know, we do this all day, every day. So it's not as hard as it sounds. 
So for this action step, what I would do first is I would share the success criteria. So success criteria for this action step might be uh, a clear and confident voice and stance, a repeated visual cue so that the class knows what to expect, brevity of language, to be seen looking, and to use a non-verbal uh, signal to prompt compliance. So having given those success criteria, I would now stand up, which I'm not going to do now because you won't be able to see me anymore, but in the session I would, um, and I would deliver my pre-scripted example of this action step, which I would have prepared before I came to the meeting, which I will do for you now. OK, you're right. Last 30 seconds of the Do Now activity. Last 10 seconds. <clears throat> and three, two, one. And show me empty hands. And listening hands together on the desk. Thank you. So after I delivered that model, I would then ask the teacher to feed back to me and explain how the model that I'd done had met those success criteria, why it was a good example of the action step that we were working on. Next, together, we would identify a similar moment um, that would happen in their lessons because we might not be teaching the same subject. I teach English and I coach people from different specialisms so they might have you know, different routines and activities that they do so we would identify something that was similar where they could use the same action step and we would script out the routine that they want to practice and next comes that deliberate practice for them so just like I did the teacher needs to stand up and deliver the script in just that same way then afterwards, as the coach, I would use those same success criteria to evaluate what they have done. Then they practice again and they need to correct anything that didn't go well. And you'd carry on doing that until they get it absolutely right. But the important thing here is that the deliberate practice element needs to continue beyond the point where they get their script perfect because they need to embed the right way of doing it. They need to build that automaticity in what is good. And also, as they get better, it means that you can start to increase the complexity of the situation. So you are acting as the, um, the class in this situation now as they are doing their practice. So you can throw in situations that could add complexity. So what if Tom doesn't put his pen down? What if Fatima starts talking? What if somebody walks in late? this gives them an opportunity to see how they can deal with that and for you to feed back on how to deal with that and then they could try it again the more times that the teacher can practice this in this safe space with you the closer they get to that automaticity which will mean getting it right when it really matters in their lessons in the classroom it's really important to keep practicing beyond perfection because practice makes permanent and the version that we want to be permanent is the perfect one. It makes the learning better and it just makes our job as a teacher better because we're not having to worry and think about so many things because it's 
coming more naturally to us. Finally, you can co-plan exactly when this action step is going to be used in specific lessons that week. And you can look forward to seeing it in action when you go and do your next observation, which you plan in for that next week. So this process continues. So you have a model that looks like this. So at the beginning, we're setting the rules and going into the observation, but then it follows in this cycle. Finally, what I want you to take away from this is that instructional coaching is development and not judgment. The instructional coaching is diagnostic steps by an expert and instructional coaching is deliberate practice. And I want you to take away that instructional coaching is because, as Dylan William famously said, every teacher needs to improve, not because they aren't good enough, but because they can be even better. And I believe that becoming a coach and through working with teachers, it has made me a better teacher myself because I am constantly focusing on teaching, practicing my own teaching, um, observing lessons, and that has helped me to become better too. So it has amazing gains for absolutely everybody involved. If you're interested in learning more about instructional coaching, these are some of the resources that I would recommend looking at in order to develop your knowledge and expertise. And they are things that I have read and listened to and watched in order to develop my understanding of instructional coaching and in order to develop this presentation for you today. Thank you so much. And if you would like to ask me any questions, you can tweet me at jade underscore hickim. Goodbye. <laughs>